Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Build Amazing Things Securely. Uh, I'm Laura Belmain, and I am absolutely thrilled today to have a really special guest joining us. Um, Dan Walsh is joining us from the Red Hat community. And oh my goodness, uh, if you like containers, if you like new tools you can use, this could be the one for you. So before I butcher everything about Dan and introduce him poorly, I will ask, as I do with every guest, hey, Dan. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Uh, you're quite welcome. We're glad to have you here. So who are you, Dan, as a human? As a human? Uh, let's see. I, I guess the American thing to do is to tell you what I do for a living. So I, uh, I've been a computer programmer. I am currently a senior distinguished engineer at Red Hat. I've been at Red Hat for 23 years. Wow. My career has been mainly around uh, building security type products, uh, building security into the operating system. Um, so I'm known for working on SE Linux for many years, and I've been working on container technologies for about the last 15 years. Uh, I was a contributor to Docker when Docker first started. Um, currently, I uh, uh, work on what's called Rivos, which is the Red Hat in-vehicle in operating system. So I'm um, moving to make containers into uh, different parts of the system. So I really want to put containers into your car is really what the, uh, so what uh, the, the I future. have thoughts and feelings already. Uh, this, this is going to be epic, Dan. We're going to have a great chat. Yeah. Um, okay, cool. Firstly, you know, I, I live it. I, I, uh, if for those that don't recognize my accent, I'd live, uh, I, I've lived my entire life near Boston, Mass. So I have a heavy Boston accent. I now live in, in southern Maine, right on the coast, so uh, about an hour off. Very cool. Uh, well, that, that's helped me because I could place the accent from a movie, and I was like, I can't place where this one is from. But now that explains it because I think there's some uh, gangster movies somewhere that I've listened to with that strong accent. So, you know, with yeah. the fedoras and things and that accent, um, I'm going to take you very seriously in this one, Dan. Um, and kudos to Red Hat for having the most fancy job titles that uh, I've ever heard. Um, just because, and I do this with our, our distinguished guests. Um, have you ever had a regular human job? What What was your first job before you became a distinguished super yeah. engineer? I uh, my first job I was flipping burgers for McDonald's. So fabulous! So many good no people started at the burger place. Exactly. Sweet, awesome. Uh, you know, I, I like that our audience can share that we all come from somewhere and that we don't just get born as as amazing engineers. Good. So there's so many things I want to dig into with, with you, um, Dan. So let's talk, let's talk about what you've just mentioned here, because I feel like we shouldn't just leave it on the table. You want to put containers into cars. Come on, walk me through it. What are we doing here? So it's, it's funny because, you know, this talk, the talk uh, you have uh, named is based on security uh, in, in putting applications or compu uh, computer programs into cars is more about what's called functional safety, which is slightly different than security. Now, obviously, my background has been over security for many, many years, but functional safety is all about uh, keeping people safe. So if you, you imagine driving, you're running an application, say a self-driving car, you want that car to you know stop before it you know, hit someone or uh, gets in an accident. Um, and so we, what we need to do is we need to design the so software, not only for security, but to be functionally safe, to make sure that uh, a runaway application doesn't stop, you know, a critical application from stopping the car, for example. So it's, it's, it's I've only been doing it for about uh, nine months now. So it's uh, interesting in taking my security expertise and, and container technologies and how we can, uh, isolate a container application from the host system and then concentrating on it from a, uh, again, from a functional safety point of view where, you know, we really want to make sure things like C groups and uh, different parts of the, um, of the container technologies to isolate the environment. What's happening at the automakers right now is they're trying to put, they're trying to consolidate more and more applications into uh, vehicles onto a lesser, uh, fewer number of computers. Uh, so right now, a lot of cars have up, upwards of 100 different computers just so they can isolate tasks from each other. Um, and obviously, that's expensive. It slows down development, uh, innovation in the automobiles. Um, but also with the supply chain crisis after COVID, you know, you always heard about they couldn't get these parts for cars. And what they really want to do is start to consolidate into, say, in 
two, three, four nodes, um, and then have sensors, you know, for the, all they uh, basically gathering all the sensors and and using them uh, more beefy computers to be able to uh, do more more things at once. Um, so a lot of car companies are coming in and saying they need you know cloud native or Kubernetes based uh, applications running in the car, and we're trying to work with them and figure out how you actually want to do this in a more secure and functionally safe environment. Um, so key to that I, I'm is- I'm beyond excited. I, I'm, you know, this has hit all of my nerd buttons all at the same time. So firstly, <laughs> I love that you're only nine months into this because you're in that wonderful transition period where you are seeing two worlds and how they combine. And I think for, you know, what we're talking about today, that's, that's really cool because a lot of us are new to where these spaces collide. I mean, you know, we think about containers, we think about, you know, Kubernetes and KubeCon and all of the, you know, much, if I'm honest, smaller or more kind of insulated applications of them. I mean, there's amazing things doing uh, going on in the container space, but I don't think I'd ever even considered that this would be something that would go into cars. But what you're explaining makes perfect sense. You know, yeah, I mean, if we're trying a, it, to make the most of what just, we have. It's not really car, uh, just cars. It's all, all sorts of edge devices. So... Uh, the, the wing of Red Hat that I work in now is called uh, uh, RHEL for Edge, so Red Hat Enterprise Linux. We, we're basically looking at putting Linux onto all sorts of edge devices. And um, so it could be windmills, it could be large machines, um, airplanes, um, all sorts of motorized vehicles, things like that. Um, and then looking how we can coordinate between these edge devices and back up into the cloud with Kubernetes and stuff. but my goal is to convince people to write everything with, um, in, in so that it could run both in the car and in the cloud, in and in Kubernetes. So one of the key features, you know, I actually worked on Podman for many many years, and one of the cool things that Podman has the ability to do is actually to run with Kubernetes YAML files. So uh, a lot of people in the past were into Docker Compose language, which is a different YAML file. Um, and a lot of applications been built that way, but as soon as you want to go to Kubernetes, you have to rewrite your application and rewrite the YAML file so it would work on a Kubernetes YAML. So when we were developing Podman, we, we support Docker Compose language, but we also support Kubernetes YAML directly. And so we're, we're prescribing for the uh, auto industry and for anybody that's running on the edge is to use Kubernetes YAML to describe your complex applications. And then you could run your tests and CI and in, in the cloud, in a Kubernetes environment, like OpenShift. Or, um, and, but then when you take it down to the edge device, you can run it with a nice simple tool like Podman and run the application without the overhead that you have to have with Kubernetes um, environment. So we get the coordination between the two. Now, one of the cool things when we go to security and into functional safety uh, about Podman is Podman really integrates well into the entire operating system. Um, so Podman can run rootless mode really well. So we can, you know, we can isolate the processes just using standard permission flags inside of uh, Linux. Um, Podman also integrates really well with the thing called the user namespace, which allows you to have sort of privileged mode root access inside of your container, but it's not really root on the host operating system. Um, so we allow you to easily run containers, uh, multiple containers all with separate UIDs. Uh, so they're isolated sort of using standard uh, security. Um, and that get, helps us with our functional safety argument saying, you know, this application can't accidentally cause, uh, you know, some kernel feature to be activated um, that require, you know, by taking advantage of root process, root uh, capabilities, because nothing in there is running as root. Um, then we look at, you know, wrapping things with C groups and, and constraints. And one of the cool things uh, also where Podman is, uh, is developed has been its integration with System D. Um, for those that don't know on this call, System D is the, the standard in its system that most Linux operating systems work with now. And Podman is in incredibly integrated into uh, System D to make um, running services inside of containers easy. So uh, where there's a, a new tool called Podman Quadlet, which allows us to define applications in, in sort of system D syntax, um, but the containers, but we also can fully configure the C groups controls. So again, going back to um, how we want to isolate applications from interfering with um, what's going on in the car. So again, 
uh, a lot of it is uh, using my expertise over the years on understanding how containers work and then how how to um, translate these into things and things that engineers on automobiles would uh, would understand. Th so. This is really this is really interesting, Dan. So a very long time ago, you know, many gray hairs ago, let's call it that. Um, I was involved. I used to be a, a qualified Red Hat systems engineer. So a, a lot of what I would spend my time not at the level you are, um, but um, was was configuring these things and this was way back before you know containerization was a, a well-known thing and you know we'd be playing around with se linux and jails and all sorts of things um and what i love about this progress is you know we talk a lot about you know docker and kubernetes but we don't really appreciate the technologies that needed to exist for us to get to the point where we can put a container in a car and not go oh my goodness this is going to go horribly horribly wrong yes. um I, th I think that's a wonderful thing. And, you know, the fact that you've been on this journey going from the SE Linux space all the way through this to the, you know, the current iteration, the current use case, that's cool. That, that's really exciting. It's, it's funny because I, I actually started, to give you a little history of me at Red Hat, I started working on SE Linux back in 20, uh, two, basically year 2001, just before 9-11. Um, and... Uh, that's when I started working in SE Linux, but about five years in, about 2005 timeframe, we started using this new concept of, of a thing called namespaces. So uh, we, we actually introduced a thing called the PAM namespace to allow us to, uh, SE Linux usually works in these top secret, secret environments. And they, uh, the people that dealt with these type of machines wanted to be able to log into a system at secret and see a home directory that had all the secret data and then log in at top secret and see all the top secret data. Uh, but not see both with the same login, um, depending on which network device they were coming in. And so we used PAM namespace to set this up. And PAM namespace allowed you to have uh, set up the mount namespace in a way that um, your home directory is different mount points depending on which way you came in. So that they, it allows you to see different versions of the mount table. And that was sort of the first real container technology, the first namespace that started to to arise. A few years later, I uh, worked on a thing I called the SE Linux Sandbox, which uh, allowed you to run multiple web browsers in your home directory. And one would be tied to the internet and one would be tied to the intranet. And it would have totally different views of your home directory and totally isolated um, Firefoxes at the time. And uh, I called the SE Linux Sandbox. And of course, no one heard of containers. And I was using things like SE Linux and uh, namespaces and C groups to isolate this environment. Uh, a couple of years later, um, you know, this was all uh, back in 2008, 2006 to 2008. Um, I started working on a thing called OpenShift, which was to isolate uh, uh, the original version of OpenShift was a web service where you would just have millions of users and any user could get onto a, a rel box um, just by giving us an email address. But you can imagine all the uh, hackers that tried to get into those. And so a lot of what I did is to make set up the systems to isolate those users from each other um, and using container technologies and SE Linux and other tools. Um, and eventually uh, we were coming out with some tools based off of that and Docker happened. And so we switched on to, we saw that Docker was gonna revolutionize the world. And so we started working on, uh, on Docker um, and I added, uh, like, SE Linux support and other things to Docker. And, and eventually, they, we kept on working on containers. Eventually, we didn't like the design of Docker because it was uh, Docker was a client server uh, setup, which involved a root running daemon. And uh, so we wanted to look at the technology. And with standards and stuff, we could start to run containers, the exact same containers that Docker ran in the same way without having to have a client and a server model with a, a root running daemon. And that's where Podman and, and all the other tools started to generate. So my entire career has been working on container, containerizing software, uh, or at least for the last 20 something years at Red Hat. So I, I think what I love about this is, you know, we've got people in the audience who like myself, like you, Dan, we've been around a little while, but we've got equally people in the audience who are just starting out. And I think it's very easy for us to look at a new technology and just not even think about where did this thing come from? Right. Um, but I think this is actually a really interesting view into the evolution of something we possibly even take for granted in some places now. 
um, and how many different technologies needed to have been played with and to have existed and to have been developed and, and improved over time to get to the point where we can stick a container in a car. Now, this still terrifies me as a security person. So I'm, 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 I need to step back a little bit to the functional safety part. So, you know, I, I don't have a fancy car, Dan. I'm, I'm yeah. you know, I'm not a Tesla driver. So um, I'm guessing that it'll be a few years till this kind of thing hits the type of vehicle that, you know, the average yeah, has we're, has. we're looking at, um, so for, to get the operating system that we're building for a car, uh, we're probably looking at end of 2025, 2024, beginning of 2025, uh, before that they'll start to uh, be available in vehicles. Uh, but it's not that far. That really isn't that far no. off. So yeah, yeah, younger me would have said that's ages and older me is like, that's like basically next week. So you're going to be yeah. busy, Dan. Yeah, it's um, uh, it, it's interesting. I mean, uh, it's all the electrification of vehicles and then uh, um, self-driving modes, things like that. Uh, you can imagine the compute power that's required to to move to this type of world. Uh, but every every single one of the car companies is all racing towards us, probably led by, you know, Tesla is sort of... Uh, forcing them all to get into this mode. And uh, it's interesting. Uh, one of the, uh, you were talking about the technologies as they came along um, that sort of changed changed the world and got us to containers. There's a, there's a technology that's actually, it's, it's, uh, one of the people on my team, Alex Lassen's talking about it right now at, um, there's a storage conference going on in, um, I think in uh, Canada and uh, it's called Compose FS. So one of the things, one of the, uh, and this just comes from a security and a functional safety point of view, is how how do you, um, how do we secure the, how do we know that the data on a system has not been modified from underneath us? Um, from a obviously from a security point of view, we're looking at uh, um, you know worried about a hacker again onto a machine. But from a functional safety point of view, you have to worry about you know, acts of God or, you know, gamma rays or something that flips a bit on the system. But if you're running a piece of software that somehow was corrupted um, on the system uh, in a functionally safe environment, you want the car to realize it and, you know, pull over into the breakout, breakdown lane and stop, you know, stop self-driving car at that point. Um, and so when uh, there's been technology in, in the Linux kernel to handle this, like F FM Verity and uh, different ways of, of using checksums to make sure the files haven't been manipulated. Um, but on read-write systems, those have always been difficult and getting them into container technology. And so this new technology called ComposeFS is being worked on right now to uh, instrument the file systems in such a way that we can take advantage of even on up towards read-write mode, or at least towards containers, really spread the ability to verify files on a file system haven't been, you know, but via checksum, store the checksum and then read the file and compare the checksum to the file and make sure that nothing's, you know, the individual blocks have not been modified um, on the system. So a lot of this technology that going forward is gonna allow us to get to functional safety and to better security is being developed right now. So, and hopefully will be in place so to vehicles yeah I, I mean no pressure team i think we feel i feel like as a community we should be sending you know like energy drinks or something to make sure that you've all got got what you need to get through this yeah. but I, like just picking out what you're talking about here i mean i'm i've done all sorts of software many of us in the audience have you know um i've been lucky enough to don't do real-time software in kind of high-risk environments at cern but i've also done you know e-commerce sites in php um, and if you are from the, you know, e-commerce or banking or something, the idea that you need to consider in your threat model, if you will, not just a person did a bad thing or wants to get to this objective, but also the sun can change the what is written on my media is, is mind blowing. So how do you approach this, Dan? So, you know, you've done security for a long time. You're now in functional safety. What has changed about how you have to think about threat and risk and I think when it, building. it's just, yeah, I, I mean, I guess just the, the big threat there is just realize that something happened and then we need to trigger events in the system in such a way that the monitor, the, the car monitor or the uh, automotive monitoring system is able to fire off and realize that, hey, something's very wrong in, in, in this vehicle and get it into what's called safety mode, which 
usually means pulling it over into the breakdown lane and and or at least alert if you're say you're driving along in self driver mode to alert the driver that something's gone wrong in the computer system you need to take you know the human being needs to take over at this point and start driving the vehicle um, or in in catastrophic cases you want the, the car to slow down be automatically pulled into a breakdown lane and and call your uh you know, tow truck to take me to a dealership to get the uh, operating system reflashed. Um, and, and that's that's literally what we have to worry about in, in this type of system. Um, so, but you know, yeah. it's, it's, it's interesting, you know, these are things that we all have to think about. Uh, but we also, and, and other things I deal with are uh, what I call freedom from interference. So in your vehicle, you're going to have uh, not only you know, safety type applications running, but you're going to have uh, in, the, in the car world, they call it quality management. So it's quality software, but it's not uh, functionally safe. It's the security um, concerned. So think of, you know, your infotainment system, the, you know, the backseat uh, TVs running Netflix or uh, any, any of the apps that are uh, sort of secondary and what we need to do with again with tech, container technology is allow those to run on the same operating system as the functionally safe uh, code, say the self-driving car or the thing that's going to activate the brakes. Um, but we need to make sure and describe to the people that are going to be building the software how to use parts of the operating system to isolate those. So uh, I'm working on uh, you know setting up all the ways that you can set up C groups to make sure that um, the applications in the non functionally safe part of the car, you know, if, if you have an application, say you have the, uh, the Netflix app is going wild and using up a hundred percent CPU, you still need the, the software that's actually driving the car to not be interfered with. And how do we set up, how do we isolate those uh, in the environments? Um, so it's a lot of under, a lot of my learning is understanding how how the uh, car companies want to engineer these systems and then applying technologies that we know exist in Linux um, to giving them the perfect the perfect match of the technologies. Wow, th this is cool. I mean, I I don't know how you get started with playing with these kind of systems. So, uh, if if our audience were kind of keen to perhaps be a bit bolder than they might be normally and really dig into some of these underlying technologies so that they can kind of understand the type of things we're talking about. Where would you recommend people get started then? So we, we work you know, uh, at Red Hat, everything's done in the open. So a lot of the technologies that I'm talking about building um, are available on GitHub containers. Uh, two specific ones are Herte, which is H-I-R-T-E, which is the uh, German word for shepherd. So this is a a tool that we're using for sort of our orchestrator. So um, I don't want to call it a Kubernetes, uh, dumbed down Kubernetes, but it's a uh, mechanism for uh, managing lots and lots of services, really managing remote system Ds uh, on the system. The, the quality management software is in the same site, github.com slash containers slash QM. Um, and then if you want to look into Podman itself, that's a github containers slash Podman. Um, but a lot of this technology is, is really under early development, but it's all been done mm -hmm. in open. So if we can get people to yeah. contribute, we would love it. Um, ought to look at this technology as being more than just for our automobiles, but again, to look at it as you know, we want to get functional safety. We want to get Linux to be the primary functional safe operating system. Where right now, Linux sort of owns the, the data center and the internet, um, but what people are running in in functionally safe systems like cars is is very primitive you know it's a primitive linux it's yachtel linux it's all hand built um and does not cannot evolve quickly like the stuff that's running in the data centers in the cloud um so we want to get linux all the way down into your edge devices um so you know, the first step is proving that linux is functionally safe um and then um getting it you know eventually into airplanes and automobiles and large machines that create do manufacturing and uh, just uh, there's thousands and thousands and millions of millions of computers out there uh, but how can we get sort of standard linux across the entire uh infrastructure uh, so not just you know right now from red hat we 
do well in cloud and we do well in uh, data centers, but now we want to get out to the edge devices. So, uh, although when we talk edge devices, I always I always put the hinder in this. A former CEO of Red Hat says that we're not putting uh, operating systems in sprinkler heads. So these are these are going to be fairly beefy machines, not uh, not necessarily at the level of IoT devices, but something a little well, bit. It's different. good to have a line. It's it's yeah. good to know where you're going to stop. Um, yeah, we're yeah, going to take over the world, but not sprinklers. Yeah, nothing. Nothing's going to cost fifty dollars to get it. You know, anything that's okay, cool. I, I love this um, because, you know, there's always been this running joke and I think we're all over it now. But, you know, next year will be the year of Linux on the desktop. I don't think you're aiming for that anymore. I think you're having Linux in space. This oh, is yeah. going to be Linux on spaceships and airplanes. And I think that's a glorious thing. And I think Linux, uh, the funny thing about Linux on the desktop is it never really happened. But Linux on the cell phone did happen. So Absolutely. Android operating system is Linux on the cell so. Most most cell phones in the world run Linux um, now. Uh, you know, obviously Apple has has and that's running BSD type. Um, but yeah, the the number of of machines that are running some form form of Linux to wash any other operating system by you know hundred to one at this point. So Linux is everywhere except on your Macs and your Windows boxes. Although and I think we'll be okay with that, to be honest, because it's going to take us and do some amazing things in every other edge device we have, apart from sprinklers. Um, so look, Dan, I'm, I'm looking at the time and I think we need to wrap this up. Um, if you were going to give any advice or any takeaways to our audience today to explore this space more, or perhaps, you know, an area you think is exciting to dig into, what should our audience go and have a look at? I think, uh, well, obviously, we've been talking a lot about edge edge computing, and um, I I think, uh, well, first of all, I'd love to have them look into Podman, so uh, and and specifically how Podman integrates with the operating system. So if you're going to run, if you're running small services on a single node or a small services on a group of nodes that doesn't require a full Kubernetes environment, um, look into how Podman can actually run applications in the most secure way possible um, and you know rootless or uh, with user namespace and all the functionality that's in there so I, that's where i would and then obviously i advise them to buy my book which goes into uh, i have two chapters that will blow your mind and amount of security talk in those so on on how to that amazing that. so well, well we love a good book recommendation um, we'll put a link, in fact, if you like, Dan, in yeah. the show notes so that po folks can just click through. What's the name of the book? Sorry, I did speak about you. Man in Action. It's by Manning. Pod Man in Action. Yeah, Manning Publishing. Fabulous. Manning Publishing. Okay, well, I, I'm definitely going to go and have a play. And I think, you know, if you're looking for your why should I go learn this t new technology that's actually based on a lot of older technologies, why should you go play with Podman? Well, let's put it this way. This is the type of technology that is going to be changing the way that we put software into cars and into planes and to other edge devices. So if you're looking at where does this fit with our amazing technology future, well, this is the gateway technology to doing that. And I think that's really cool. And the fact that it's done in the open means that we can go and play and we can explore and see what we could do. Maybe you know, one day some of our audience will become the future distinguished engineers uh, that the world needs to take it the next step. And that's pretty cool. And you can contribute now. So if you come and absolutely and open up pull requests and help us out. Yeah, be a good open source citizen and get stuck yeah. in. Um, it's been absolutely wonderful to have you, Dan. Um, I've learned so much. I'm now very curious. I have reading to do, I think. Um, so thank you so much for sharing all of your wisdom and your journey. Um, and perhaps we could have you again in you know 24, and we'll see if you made exactly. made that deadline. Did yeah. we change the world? Exactly. All right. Great. Nice meeting you. Thank you so much.